So the agenda for today is we gonna st we we already started by by saying hi, and the next thing that we're gonna do is Yuri will uh, do a small introduction to sketch noting. So if you want, you can sketch note the whole talk from Jeff, but also if you not feel that confident uh, in sketch noting, we will say which parts are are sketch noting friendly so you can sketch note only those three parts then we're gonna have a talk from uh, jeff about team mastery and a small exercise at the end from yuri about preparing a template for one of the things that jeff will talk about and we will finish by asking you to give us feedback about this session so that's the plan for today And also, if you would like to share some of the notes and, and pictures along the way, uh, you can either share them in the upload photo to the meetup group or you on Instagram, for example, use on one of these uh, hashtags as well. But uh, other than that, uh, I think we'll just get started. So that means over to you, Yuri. Hello, everyone. I'm Yuri. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'll start by setting a timer for myself and uh, I need to share my screen as well so you could see what I'm doing. Let me know if you can see what I'm doing. Can you see what I'm doing? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's get going. I'm going to introduce you to the basics of sketch noting in 15 minutes, which is a quite a challenging um, task to do. I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Yuri. What I do is um, I am an agile coach and that's my full-time job. And uh, when I have some spare time, not being an agile coach and, uh, and not spending time with my family, I do a lot of visual thinking and sketch noting. That's my passion. And I guess I uh, qualify well for uh, the uh, uh, honorable uh, title of uh, visual agilist and uh, thanks guy for uh, guys for having me over it's uh, it's an honor to be here with you and um, the way uh, we're going to discover the world of sketch noting and uh, in my understanding the best way to talk and uh, discuss the topic is to demonstrate instead of just talking so i'll be uh, sketch noting my talk my talk on sketch noting, right? And um, first thing you want to learn about sketch noting is that you don't need to be worrying much about you being slow. So right now I'm writing down the title of my talk and uh, most uh, commonly people get stressed because you don't write or draw as fast as you speak. And sometimes it's uh, intimidating and it makes people feel uncomfortable, but you just need to get used to that and be okay with that. You don't have to be super fast, you, as long as you're effective. So that's first thing you learn about the, the technique. It's not to stress you out, but to help you out and to help you uh, have fun and enjoy the process. So as I said, uh, sketch noting is a technique. So we will start by uh, talking about uh, what, what kind of a technique uh, is that so I'm using a smaller writing here and uh, I'll be talking about uh, the technique in this part of the paper and as as uh, Pavlo said uh, feel free to just uh, follow along and copy what I'm doing it's also a better idea to learn uh, sketch noting by doing so how how this technique works is that uh, there is a person hopefully you, if you like uh, the idea of sketch noting, holding uh, maybe a pencil, a pen, a marker, whatever allows you to leave a mark on the surface. And uh, that person is probably leaving the marks on paper like I'm doing right now, but that could also be a digital uh, device for, for that matter. Any material that allows you to create a spatial representation 
and I will get back to spatial many times, representation. So what that means is that uh, something that allows you to create an overview of things on, on the two-dimensional space. And when do you use this uh, sketch noting technique? Is when, for example, you hear something, like you are in a meeting or you are um, in a conf uh, attending a conference or a training session, so you're hearing a lot of information. And that information is uh, received by you in a linear form of a format of a, a language coded uh, message. So it's a lot of word after word after word, and then your brain uh, uh, translates that into meanings. So you hear that information, you try to arrange uh, the things that you hear about on that uh, two-dimensional space by just uh, sketching and drawing. Well, I will use the word sketch, so we try to avoid a word draw as much as possible, because a lot of people, people might say, well, I cannot draw, so we will not talk about drawing. And, and then when you uh, organize uh, stuff on paper or digitally, what happens is that you now additionally to hear in this information, you begin to see this information. So you see this information and inside of your head, something is happening. So your brain is processing a lot of information. There is a lot of thinking and processing happening. And now you are um, enhancing the process by hearing and translating that into meanings and then seeing that. And suddenly this process becomes more effective, more robust. And if you do it right, if you do not put too much stress on yourself, it also becomes uh, more fun working this way. And if we look closer into what constitutes a sketch uh, note, if we just uh, double click there and try to peek into what, what, what a sketch note could be, basically it's anything that is organizing information on a piece of paper or digitally where you have different types of uh, concepts organized uh, in a way that you can, uh, by looking at things, understand how concepts are related uh, to each other. Basically, this here is my sketch noting of explaining the technique, which is nothing more just a spatial organization of how different pieces of information appear here. And um, I was drawing as I was talking, but uh, equally so, I could be uh, note taking uh, in this manner someone talking about this topic. And I arrived at this uh, spatial representation of what I heard by combining drawings and pictures uh, uh, and, and, and texts together. And right now, if, if it's the simplified version of what you see here, where you can see um, buckets of uh, pieces and pieces of information that now you can analyze in an order that you prefer. So basically that's the sketch noting. And I, I use the sketch noting to explain the sketch noting. And now we will reverse engineer the main components that constitute um, a successful sketch note basically. And I already showed you these components, but uh, I will go through them one by one components uh, so that uh, we can talk about them individually and maybe learn a trick or two additionally. So the first main component we want to talk about is the spatial organization. And what that means is that the sketch note is always something that is spreading information in a two dimensional space. And it always comes with the fact that you just simply start drawing things on paper or digitally. As long as you even randomly put concepts on the two dimensional space, that triggers a different way for your brain to operate. Uh, there are some theories uh, suggesting that the way the brain works is that it uh, operates so-called mental models, which is nothing else but 
but just a, a, a graph. So basically when you put something on paper, like, like five circles here, you trigger a different mode of your mo uh, brain operating where it's probably operating with uh, the more natural uh, uh, in, uh, like representation of information. Instead of just hearing the artificial uh, coding in language, you just uh, tap into the inherent functions of your brain directly by showing something that is close to probably how the information is represented inside of it. So the the first main component is just to place st stuff on, p on a piece of paper, even if it's a totally random organization. It, it, this fact alone triggers your brain to start working a bit differently. So that does the trick itself alone. So some people say, well, I don't know which, uh, uh, which composition should I use, what kind of organization on, on paper, and they get so stressed, and then it stops them from using sketch them because they have this fear of getting things wrongly, choosing their own uh, composition. What I'm saying right now is that don't worry about that. Just, just even if you put stuff randomly, you're already uh, there, gain some value for yourself. Now, the next uh, step is, uh, or not step, basically a component. The next component is uh, using all sorts of connections. So if you remember that uh, statement about mental uh, models, uh, which are graphs, uh, graphs are the connection between, uh, it's, it's a combination of concepts interconnected. So if you play stuff on a piece of paper, uh, our brain will start uh, thinking in terms of patterns, trying to understand, okay, how do these uh, relate to each other? Which parts are more important? And you can help it uh, by uh, either explicitly or implicitly suggesting connections. So um, there can be a, an implicit way of connecting things. For example, in this case, by just placing a person centrally and, and then organizing other parts around that person you can kind of suggest a certain natural connection between these things. So we know that uh, a thought bubble coming out of the head is probably a thought, and then the uh, uh, audio waves uh, radiating is probably something related to hearing. So these are just implicit connections that allow us to hold these meanings together. But you could also use explicit connections, for example, dotted, dashed, solid lines, uh, arrows of all sorts and styles in order to explicitly uh, establish connections between uh, the meanings that you put to paper. So for example, you can say, okay, these two things are feeding into my head and the product of uh, my brain processing is something else. So if, keep in mind that this, the sketch noting is heavy about connections and don't forget to use them. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, using the texts. So a lot of people uh, getting into visual thinking and sketchnoting in particular, uh, they, like, they start drawing more than uh, writing down because uh, the writing down is looked uh, 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 down at because yeah, it's all text. We, we, we want to get away from text. We want to, to draw uh, more. But then a text uh, can be a visual token, which is easier and faster uh, than a drawing. So we shouldn't just cast that aside. And what is important about the text is that uh, the meaning is uh, translated by using the different size of text, but also sometimes using different style of text as well. So for example, uh, you can uh, drive attention to uh, meanings and their priorities by just shifting between the size of text and uh, their style. So in this case, um, there will be a less importance with this text, while there will be more perceivable importance with this text. Uh, the next uh, big component to sketch noting is icons. Icons are very important, and that is probably one of the hardest parts for newcomers to this type of technique, because a lot of people who work in so-called uncreative jobs, they state, I cannot draw. 
but uh, there is a, a hack to it. You don't need to become an artist. You just need to learn how to draw several really simple icons, like a U meant to represent a person. A stack of uh, you people uh, denoting uh, a team. Um, you can just use simple shapes like uh, squares and circles and just slightly update them and turn them into smileys and buildings. And you can turn a triangle into a milestone icon. You can turn a diamond shape by just drawing some extra elements in order to create a pseudo 3D shape for a product. And uh, sometimes uh, you need to map uh, emotional aspects and all you need to do is just to remember uh, what combination of simple strokes uh, manifests a certain emotional expression. And then, and then you can also remember that uh, visual thinking and sketch noting in particular is also um, effective through the use of uh, frames and borders. So frames and borders. I will show you uh, what that means. In, in my case, um, while, while the sketch note in demonstration is almost done, uh, it starts to, it starts to, um, to mess up because there is a lot of information and now it becomes a bit difficult to navigate. Yes, I remember uh, how the narrative developed, but, but for a person who sees that for the first time, it can be um, a bit difficult to understand what that is about. And then you can use frames and borders in order to alleviate the problem and make it easier to navigate through this visual clutter. So for example, if I draw a simple border like this, it will suggest a certain uh, division between the uh, meanings that were placed on, on the two-dimensional space. Drawing borders around titles gives them more uh, visual meaning and value. And uh, this is like a, an auxiliary technique, but it's very powerful allowing you to organize the information that you're trying to share. And finally, when you work with digital media and when you work with paper, if you use uh, some fancy tools I'm going to show you, you can also engage with uh, colors uh, to further allow you accentuate certain meanings. I use two colors when I work with uh, paper and uh, digital media where you can choose um, colors. I use gray for shadows. And I use brilliant yellow for the highlights. I'll just quickly demonstrate you what that allows you to do. First, I use shadows when the sketch noting is done, and I just want to accentuate uh, the meaningful parts of uh, the sketch note. And my uh, rule of thumb is that I would apply shadows to everything that is presumably material. Uh, like like a drawn uh, object. Text is super abstract, I wouldn't give it a shadow, but if it's something like an icon, uh, something that has um, a, a materialistic representation in real life, I would grant it a shadow. And I do that by just simply drawing a, a kind of a following uh, shadow on the side, something like that. And sometimes I even give that to things like uh, boxes and frames. So what happens if you see what happens, it, it is as if uh, the, the entire sketch note um, kind of popped up and it's now making it easier to navigate because it allows you to separate meaningful parts or material part from the abstract parts like uh, notes and uh, titles. And it's easier to navigate, but also make it, it makes it more uh, what you call it Instagrammable because now you can take a snapshot and then impress your friends, right? And then highlights allows you to uh, solidify uh, the um, uh, the priorities by guiding uh, the person's um, sight through a predefined sequence. For example, if you want them to start here 
uh, you would place uh, like more color here and then they will guide to uh, smaller titles and then eventually to smaller colored pieces. And that is what exactly I would like uh, to happen when um, I am reading this information or someone else is reading. I want to help them navigate and therefore I use the color for that. So I know I um, overspent time a bit and um, that was not planned, but that is pretty much the demonstration of technique. And um, I hope it gives you some good ideas about how you could use that. Um, I also hope that some of you chose uh, to follow alone and maybe created your own uh, versions of uh, this sketch noting demonstration. And I'm going to use these techniques um, when we get to Jeff's uh, talk and um, I hope that I can keep up with uh, his uh, fantastic presentation and create a nice sketch noting for that. Cool, super. Thank you for that, uh, Yuri. And then we move on to, to Jeff's talk. And, and um, while we do that, you uh, are welcome to, uh, if you like to try to sketch and all the whole thing and if you are new to this you can uh, also we will point out the the parts that are more suitable for for sketching um you can follow uh, two cameras you can follow either yeah the presentation here or you can also follow uh, your sketch noting in view options you can uh, in zoom you can choose which uh, which screen you would like to to follow and if you have two screens, you can follow both at the same time. Mind blown. Okay. Thank you. I guess, I guess I'm up then. So yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm here to, to talk a little bit about a book that I've recently written around teamwork. And I think it's, I think it's really important. I think it's even more important now than when I actually wrote it <clears throat> because dealing with complex situations requires great collaboration uh, and collaboration that isn't managed from a, from a micromanagement perspective. Uh, I will, uh, so that as, as, as already been said, you can either watch the slides, you can watch the sketch noting, or you can watch both. You can switch between the two. Um, I'm going to do something a couple, a couple of times during this talk, you'll see something flash up on the screen like this. <clears throat> which is a bit of a, a visual signal that that's an opportunity for you to play around with sketch noting, but uh, you should see that a few times. So um, I, I'm, I'm aware that we're coming from lots of different places around the world. Uh, and so we've all got our different lockdown situations. I think in the UK, we're, we're still pretty bad. Um, we still haven't got a lot of things open like hairdressers and pubs and things like that. And we're not going back into the offices. So I'm going to have to get you to engage your memories a little bit. And uh, uh, if any point you want to add some questions to the slide, the little, co the little code will be at the bottom of all the slides. The, remember the times when um, you could actually meet up in person and you didn't have to stay a certain distance apart from each other uh, and you could see their lips move without wearing a mask. Well, one of the, back in those, what you might call the, the good old days, uh, there was a team that I was working with who were in uh, a, a product backlog refinement session. So some of them were there in person, some of them were there on video call, because as we all know, remote working was still a thing before COVID-19. And so they were with their product owner and they were looking through some of the upcoming items, the stories that they were thinking about working on and planning in the next, in the next sprint. And in the room, as well as the product owner, there was this, uh, this new, what they call, I think her job title was a business sales lead. Uh, and we'll call her Karen, just to be kind. And Karen was really excited because she's got some new clients that she reckons she's this close to landing. If only the development team could just knock out a few more features. And there was a bit of tension in the air. So as a coach, I'm quite new to the people, so I don't really know the dynamics, but I've seen a few similar situations and I could, I could almost smell the tension, if you know what I mean. So after, after the session had finished and Karen had gone and the product owner had gone, one of the team members said to the rest, are you thinking what I'm thinking? 
if I'm being brutally honest, that wasn't exactly what they said, but because I don't know who's going to be listening, I'll probably will stick to that rather than what they actually said, just for safety. And so after they, after the, they asked this question, they all got up and they all left the room and they all met up at a coffee shop. Again, hopefully some of you can still remember what those are. There's nice places where you could meet and chat with friends or work colleagues. And they, they went right straight to the back, straight to the back of the coffee shop where they'd obviously gone before, considered it sort of their table, if you like. And the first person there had already ordered the drinks for the team because they knew what, was, what everybody was going to have. There was you know, a cappuccino for Ashlyn, there was a soy latte for, for Rashmi, and I drink a black Americano, which they'd already picked up on. So the drinks were already on their way. And even the remote people were there. So someone had brought them on the, on the, the, the laptop. I think it was actually a tablet, but it's not, uh, they, they were there. And there was this sort of, again, it wasn't state the same tension, but there was a degree of unease around, around the team. Um, and eventually, once everybody had sort of settled down, one of the team members, Wally. Now in the picture, that's the person standing up. As you can see, it's a lady, not, not an usual name in England for, for a lady, Wally. And it wasn't actually her real name, but we'll come back to that later on. And she, she started off the conversation. She stood up and she was quite animated. And just from her demeanor, you got the impression, or I, at least I got the impression that she was, she was pretty angry with Karen. Um, and she's saying things like, I knew this was going to happen. You know, you give them an inch, they take a mile. Other and things like that, which kind of gave the impression, you know, every, the world's going to end, everything's terrible, we're doomed kind of thing. Uh, and she, she had a little bit of a monologue until someone else in the team stood up and said, whoa, 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 hold on, Miss Purple. She called Wally Miss Purple. Uh, could we get a yellow perspective? Now, for me, I didn't know what that meant, but they obviously did. And Wally was, was still quite emotional, right? But she took the comment from Lindsay, I would say, in good humor. She, you know, she sort of had a little bit of a giggle about it. Yeah, so, oh yeah, so, so you, I get your point, I get your point, that kind of thing. And she said, okay, let's, let's, let's bring Lindsay into the conversation who apparently was going to give us a yellow perspective, whatever that meant. And so here's Lindsay, she was on the, uh, uh, she was joining virtually. And uh, Lindsay said, well, I don't really know Karen very well yet. Um, she's quite new, um, but she probably wants to make a good impression. You know, she's, she's here, she wants to hit the ground running. She probably wants to add some value pretty quickly. You know, she's probably feeling under pressure, actually, because the organization um, needs, needs some new wins, if you like. And, you know, she's, she's seeing these opportunities, not just to win these new clients that she's talking about, but also she's seeing the opportunities to get some features out there that would actually get us some cash, all right, that, to build some of the other stuff that we really want to build. So I think she's, she's seeing all of this stuff, uh, and I, I don't think she's actually trying to do, any, do us any harm. I don't think she's being a bad person. She's doing a job, and I think it's a, it's a good job. So that was Lindsay's impression. And I, I was interested in what they meant by this, this purple and, and yellow thing. And so they talked me through, here's your first sketch noting opportunity, people. They, uh, they talked me through a little bit of a, what you might call a personality profiling tool that they went through. Now I'm not going to sit here and, and give you the name of the tool because the tool itself is not important. Um, it wasn't that it was a good tool or the right tool. It was just something that they did. Now, anything that tries to, to assess your personality is going to be flawed uh, by its nature. It's, it's impossible to, to do that because we're all so unique and we're all so different. And so the team did this little exercise with, as we say in England, a pinch of salt. So they didn't put too much emphasis on it. They didn't put too much faith in it. But they, you know, they, they and they laughed along the way because there was some, some really basic oversimplifications of people's personality but there were also some really quite telling truths if you like that, that people recognized about themselves so so there were, there were four personality types that this tool was talking about and just remember it's not about this is the right tool 
but they were the Reds. Okay, now the Reds, these people, they're, they're really very driven, okay? High achievers, they want to get stuff done. And one of the ways that they like to get stuff done is by making sure that they're in control. Um, you know, we, we've got to do it right, and there is a right way, and I will, I will be responsible for making sure that happens. In order to do that, they're, they're quite comfortable making decisions. Uh, and they're more than happy speaking up. Um, and this is you know, a couple of people in the team thought, yeah, the, yeah, okay, I can see myself in that a little bit. And you probably recognize a few people. And it's none of these colors are good. None of these colors are bad. Okay. Uh, so it's just about thinking about them. The yellows, so like Lindsay, they're very optimistic by nature. Uh, they, they, instead of seeing all the the things that could go wrong. They see how we could make successes of things. They, they tend to uh, look for the, uh, the more favorable interpretations, if you like. They see a glass as being half full rather than half empty, you know that type of person. They're happy to talk, really nice to be around, great conversationalists, always bringing people up, you know, telling a joke, looking for the positive, that kind of person. Again, not good, not bad, just is. The blues, okay, so we had a couple of blues in the team. Now, they would describe themselves as realistic as opposed to naive. So the blues might look at the yellows and think, yeah, you're, you're, you're naive. You're, you, people are going to take advantage of you and your optimism. You're not really living in the real world. Whereas the yellows might look at the blues and think you're quite uh, cynical or pessimistic. And that's, that's that kind of tension there, if you like. But there's, there's other aspects to them. So they, these, these blues, if you like, they're very analytical. So they're, they're very good at identifying risks. They're very good at identifying cause and effect. Uh, they can see patterns in things. They really like detail, uh, making sure that we've really thought things through. They quite often don't talk a lot. So they're, they're often in a, in a meeting or something like that. They'll, they'll sit back, they'll watch, they'll observe, they'll think, they'll make notes. Um, but when they do speak, it's usually something that's not trivial um, again not good not bad just a just a different personality type and then we've got our greens now the greens referred to as very very calm and logical um, easy going don't really like conflict you know they want to make sure that everybody's okay so there's a high degree of tolerance there you wouldn't see them making judgments the greens and those are the four basic colors now, obviously, there's, there's a lot more to this, and I said it's a very simplistic model. But I'm interested in, in we've got, I think, I can see 90, 97 participants at the moment. I'd be interested to see what kind of, uh, kind of mix we've got. So if I bring up a poll on the screen, you should see the opportunity to, to say which color you most associate with based on the really basic overview that I've put out there. And remember, none of these are good and none of these are bad. You can see the scores coming in. I don't know if you can see the scores coming in. I wonder whether that's just me, but we've already got almost half of you voted, which is uh, which is good good input already. Two thirds of you have already voted. So yeah, there'll be times when you think of yourself a little bit more perhaps green, and times when you think of yourself a little bit more red. But just what do you most closely associated with? Uh, it's not that you're going to be in one box forever. I'll give you a couple more seconds for the last few people. Uh, so get your voting quickly. And I will stop it there. So of the people that did vote, these are the results. So pretty even, really. A pretty even mix. A uh, little bit more greens, but only, only marginally. Um, I'll share those results then. Make sure you can all see them. So very, very close mix. and. That's not necessarily a good or a bad thing either, but what I have seen in teams is, and what this team found, the most useful thing about this exercise was not, oh, we've got too many reds, let's get rid of one red and bring in another yellow. It was just a greater awareness of how people think, their default thought processes, the strengths that they bring to the team, and where we might need to balance out certain aspects of our, of, of our team to have a more rounded view of certain things. So that was, that was interesting for them. They, they'd found that they'd been able to 
relate with each other better. They've found that they've been able to collaborate better. They found they've been able to even have a bit more fun. Uh, they could they could see people's actions as, and where they were coming from a lot more. So back to our <clears throat> back to our team. I mentioned well, it wasn't me actually. It was it was one of the team members who called um, Wally Miss Purple. Now purple isn't a colour on there, obviously, but Wally, when they did this, they decided that she was very on the borderline between red and blue. And so when you mix red and blue, you get purple. And the team had taken this model and sort of made it their own, if you like, which I think is probably the most important thing for any team with a model, because all models are wrong, but some can be useful. And the way that the team starts taking ownership of something, that's generally a really good sign uh, around team team development, team growth. So this team then, what do they do? They, they invited, um, they invited, well, they actually started using this in other aspects of their work as well. So like daily scrums, they'd start talking about, you know, I feel quite uh, yellow today, or I feel quite ochre today, or I feel that kind of thing. Um, they'd also done some other things. So this is a, uh, this is a screenshot of my attempt at some kind of uh, sketch noting, if you like, this is me sketch noting out my journey line. Uh, it's an activity that you might have come across before. Uh, and I took from Lisa Atkins's great book, Coaching Agile Teams. So this is my journey over my career. And this team had done that. They'd done their own journey lines and they'd shared their journey lines with each other. So they told them about the previous the jobs they'd been at, the, their achievements outside of work. You know, they'd had kids at this time. They'd been made redundant here, um, you know, any, anything like that. And again, that sharing of information with each other about themselves proved to be really, really useful in bonding. Now, I'd seen journey lines before. Here's your second sketch noting opportunity. Uh, I'd seen journey lines before, but I hadn't seen this exercise before. Now, what this team had done is they created what they call user manuals. Now, you might have seen this before. Uh, basically, what it was is, how does Jeff work? All right. So what you've got on here is a load of symbols. You heard Yuri talk about icons. There's a lot of graphical icons on here to, um, to explain each member of the team. So you've got a splash of green up there to indicate that I was very much a green personality rather than a red or a blue. I liked sport, you know, I liked my music. And then there were the specific skills that I brought to the team. So I might be a good listener, for example. I might be quite creative or innovative. I might be quite brave. Perhaps that's a useful skill that I bring to the team, knowing my strengths. But there are a few things that if I was on your team, you'd probably want to be a little bit aware of. Uh, so I've got a little, I can't, I can't show you my, my cursor, but I've got the, the, under the warning sign, there are three icons. And they represent the fact that if people are late, that really does bug me. I, I really like starting on time. I don't like finishing late. And I also like balance. So I find myself taking the side of people that I don't necessarily agree with, but if I feel they're being bullied, I'll generally back them up even if I don't believe in them. And that sort of, I, 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 my, my buttons get pressed if I feel a sense of an imbalance. And I've got defects. So uh, I've got some dodgy knees and I also get nosebleeds now and again. And that can freak people out if they don't know about them. So just letting people know what they can expect. My operating instructions there. Now, I'm quite slow at picking up new technology. Um, don't try and contact me on weekends uh, or after four o'clock. And if I'm in a boring meeting, I might fall asleep. So just beware. And then the one thing that I really, really liked about this user manual is they also they shared their troubleshooting aspects. So I'll give you some examples here. So the, 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 the troubleshooting question, if you like, the frequently asked question might be, I've got an email from Jeff and it seems like he's mad at me. And the response in the troubleshooting, well, he's probably just rushed it. You know, he, he's quite quick, impatient. He probably just rushed it. Why is Jeff really quiet? Well, he's probably thinking, tired, or leaving space for someone else. Uh, and why does Jeff look upset? So this, these user manuals, they'd done this, and they'd shared this with their teammates. And not only that, but they actually introduced um, the, 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 um, the, the business sales associate, I can't remember the, the job title now, but Karen, they introduced Karen to this concept, and she, um, she got involved in it as well. And the idea behind it, now, I was brought up, and it's probably a British cultural thing, but it's probably quite universal to a degree. I'd be interested in, in your opinions on this, maybe. Is, uh, I was brought up with you know, 
treat people as as you would like to be treated that was kind of a, a rule for life that little jeff was given when he went off to school and and i think that's a, that's a pretty good rule uh, but what i found with the great teams is that they don't treat people as they want to be treated they treat people as those people want to be treated and it's a subtle difference but it's quite a powerful difference finding out what works for your teammates and then playing to those preferences rather than playing to your own is a massive difference between the good teams just in my experience and the great teams so this is uh, this is the team sharing their user manuals with each other and karen got involved and she shared her user manual it was a voluntary thing now, they didn't ask her to do that but just by learning about the rest of the team there was almost a, a sense of obligation on her part because human beings tend to operate on a principle of reciprocity that i do something for you you kind of feel like you should do something for me as well it's kind of that's just a kind of natural human thing so karen um karen submitted and, and shared her user manual and when they looked back on when, when the team looked back on this this time they saw that in hindsight in retrospect as a bit of a rite of passage as sort of a, you're now part of the team like i said it wasn't something she had to do but that that level of trust it's like they crossed the line in terms of okay yeah we trust her now we trust her intentions and that i think was a, a really big shift in the relationship between karen and the rest of the team so i think it's an optional thing all right i think for me at least great teams there is an element of i have the op i have the option to be here and i have the option to not be here i'm not here because i have to be i'm not here because people have told me that you know, this is this is the formation of the team these are the members of the team um but i buy in and i i consciously subscribe to the team's culture the team's rituals the team's agreements values code if you like and part of that is developing our own language because as well as the the general business jargon that you pick up and the three letter acronyms and, and all that kind of stuff that you, you pick up teams generally develop a, a verbal shorthand the great teams do anyway and that's that's you know that's that's a good and that's part part of that is a little bit of what you might call what we call over here in england banter you know a little bit of jokiness a little bit of playfulness light-hearted good-natured teasing um, and self-teasing and this is where i'm going to go back to wally because wally wasn't her real name her real name was uh eve but there was someone else in the team already called eva and so rather than have an eve and an eva where it might have been a little bit confusing uh, wally had shared the fact that she's a big fan of disney films and eve is a character in wally uh, so she took on the nickname of wally now again this is difficult for a, for a translation aspect but wally in english is kind of a, a derogatory term it's, it's it's kind of a nice way of saying idiot and so for somebody to voluntarily take on the nickname of idiot shows an element of self banter being able to have a little bit of a joke at themselves and be prepared to to be a little bit teased now that's a dangerous dangerous thing and i was warned about writing about that in this book because banter can easily become bullying and great teams don't do that but i have yet to see a great team where they don't have fun together where they don't tease themselves so i i couldn't really bring myself to to ignore it and leave it out but it is a risky area um the after after a while you, you don't even need to use words a lot of the time and i don't know whether you have had this this thing you know, as well as your little codes and your little inside jokes uh, it's a big part of feeling belonging there, there will also be times when you don't even need to speak you just know something that the rest of your team 
is thinking. And I used to freak my wife out. So my wife and I have been together for 25 years now. And so we know what each other's, it feels like we know what each other's thinking, but we don't. So we'd be driving along in the car and I would say something. And she said, I was just thinking that Are you in, get out of my head, Jeff. She said, that's freaking me out. And it's not that I can read her mind. Obviously I can't read her mind, but because we've been through the same kind of thing so many times, we've, we've, we've picked up on each other's patterns and that happens within great teams as well. So there are times when actually we don't need to, to speak in a great team. We can kind of just give each other a look or we laugh at the same thing. Again, I don't know whether you've experienced that, but it's, it's quite a cool thing. It can be a little bit freaky to begin with, but it's quite a cool thing. And this is, this is where the team in this story, they knew, they knew that, right? So when that person said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Which, what they actually said was a code word. It was a word that I, I, I can't share with you because it was a little bit rude. But um, they said, and they knew what that meant. That word meant, let's go to the coffee shop and have a chat about it. Uh, and so they knew what they were thinking. That, that's just part of being together for a while and experiencing things together. Now, apparently, I didn't realize this. So I, I, I saw this with a team, but I didn't realize there was actually a thing. And as with most of the really clever and profound things in the world, they seem to come from Japan. Um, I think it's because they have fancy calligraphy uh, and it looks cool. Um, and the words sound cool as well. Apparently, this is, this is also known as Ishin Denshin. Now, again, I wasn't aware of this until I started writing the book when, when I was introduced to this term by a guy called Tony Richards. Now, what Ishin Denshin refers to is unspoken mutual understanding. Uh, and I think the Japanese use the phrase, what the mind thinks, the heart transmits. And it does feel a little bit like telepathy. And it's not necessarily something I'm suggesting that you should aim for. But it is a good sign in my experience that this team has been through something together. They have that collective experience. They have, they have similar experiences together. And that, that builds bonds. It builds trust. It builds rapport. So I say summary, uh, but I am going to give you a little bit after this. Just summarize what I've said so far. From my experience, great teams they do develop this, this respectful, safe, and fun common language. The word safe is important there. Uh, it's respectful, it's safe, and it's fun. Uh, they learn how each other's minds work, not so that they can manipulate each other, but to build that sense of common experience, to, to develop that shorthand so they can get through, they can solve problems, they can have conversations, they can reach resolution, they can make decisions quicker uh, and more uh, in tune with each other's preferences. Great teams know without needing to be told, they understand where people contribute to the team and they're also they're also careful that they make sure that those people know that their contributions are valued to the team. And great teams put the team's goals above their own individual goals and that's for me one of the one of the big ones because it's often unspoken in a lot of the teams that I've seen that to be part of a team, you actually have to give up a little bit of what you want. You have to sacrifice a little bit of your selfish objectives to be part of a great team. And that's not a bad thing. It might feel like it to begin with, but what you're hopefully getting is you're getting a trade. And as with all trades, in order for them to be effective, both parties need to benefit. Yeah, so I've got a lot of resource A, you've got a lot of resource B. If I give you some of resource A, you give me some of resource B, we're happy. We're happier than if we just had all of our own original resources. That's a, that's a mutually beneficial trade. But it's, it's not spoken about very often. And so I see teams making, having issues that they could easily avoid if they were to have this conversation and acknowledge that they're opting into this and letting go of something to get something else in return. Uh, your third sketch noting opportunity is this acronym that I've built the book around, which is SQUAD. So while each team, every team that I've seen is unique, absolutely, there are a few common th patterns that I've noticed and that great teams, they do have a habit of self-improvement. They want to get better, not because someone tells them to, 
not because they get a bonus if they improve, but because actually getting better is something that's that's of, of value to them. They enjoy the process of getting better. Quality is another thread, doing something properly. You know, we used to sort of have a, a joke at the company that I used to work at, which was if you're not happy to put your mobile number in the release notes, you're not proud of your work. So quality is important. Unity, that sense of togetherness, that sense of bond is there in every great team. All of the great teams that I've seen and been part of are audacious, they're brave, they, they challenge things, they take risks, they're open to failure. But they don't forget that they're there to deliver. So yes, we're getting better. Yes, we're doing things well. Yes, we're having fun and being, uh, being a great team and trusting each other and getting on well. And we're taking risks and we're risking failure. But we're also shipping something. We're delivering something. And all of the great teams have the, that I've seen, anyway, have those five things in common. But there's no process. There's no maturity model, I believe, for a team to get to great. I think every team finds their own path. And a lot of it is based on their circumstances and the challenges that they're facing and where the individuals in the team are right now and where the team is right now. But there are a number of things that, that you might look out for as your team. And I mentioned one with regards to this idea of the user journey and developing that sense of bond and that sense of trust, sharing something with other people. That, that user manual with bringing Karen into that process, where at the, at the time they didn't really think it was that important, but when they looked back on it, they thought, actually, yes, that was something quite significant. Now I use the term milestones for that with the team, team milestones. Um, largely that's because I uh, recently had uh, another baby and I was introduced to this concept of milestone cards. You know, today um, I, I had my first bath or today I took my first steps or today I threw up all in mummy's hair whatever it is there's the, there was a little card you could take out of a pack and you could take a picture next to the baby and, and save it for when they're a little bit older and embarrass them uh, but or celebrate it on Instagram whichever you prefer and so I was, I was sort of inspired by those and thought well actually teams don't really get the opportunity to celebrate the tangible milestones of their growth very well they'll have retrospectives but do they really celebrate, we are now a stronger team than we were before because we did this? Or in some cases, look at some of the milestones that other teams have achieved and thought, do you know what? Yeah, that, we would like that as, our team. as a team. We would like to work towards that milestone now. So I captured quite a few. And it's not a case of as every team needs to go off and tick all 50. All right. And there's certainly not a start with this one and then go to the next one. But there are a number of milestones that you might find along your way as a journey towards being a great team so one that i've got on here is we appreciated each other okay and you know, that, that just means saying thank you or saying well done or i appreciated what you did there and a lot of feedback in organizations focuses on what we could do better and that's really helpful it's really helpful but sometimes it's nice to know that actually what you're doing it's valued, it's useful, it's, it's, it's recognized and appreciated by those around you. And so taking a little bit of time out to say, thank you, what I call catching your teammates doing things right. Okay, it's very easy to catch someone doing something wrong, but we don't really spend a lot of time catching people doing things right, in my experience. And certainly for the Brits, we find it a little bit embarrassing when people say, well done, or thank you, or that was really good. But we, we kind of like it really. Um, and so that's one milestone potentially. And so the book has stories, like the one I told you about um, the, 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 the team there. And it also has a number of these milestone cards in the back that you can tear out and you can take a, uh, take a picture with. So maybe we developed our own language or you know, we made work fun or we put the team first instead of uh, our individuals or we found out something really important about our, uh, ourselves and our, us as a team. And on the back, there are a number of different things around those milestones. So everything that we try, everything that we do, everything that we, we, we work towards always has a risk. All right? There's always a risk that it doesn't quite work out or it has a slightly negative side effect. 
and as a team knowing what might go wrong when doing something i think is important to before you jump into something so if you're sharing if finding out something about yourselves and your teammates that's 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 vulnerable you know and if i'm going to share something with you about my um my, my nosebleeds or my career or you know how i might you know not really like it when you turn up late you now have something over me so if you want to upset me you now know just turn up late right so i'm i'm putting myself at risk by sharing this information about me and that could that that could go wrong and so aware of that and maybe it's something we work towards in a in a step by step way but there should be something beneficial right so if we found out something about our teammates um, it, what's important to us as a team that's got to be useful to us so what rewards can we expect from hitting this milestone and are, are, there, are there any rituals that we can put in place to increase our chances of hitting that milestone or making the most out of it and for each of these cards there's a set of resources that i've curated and pulled together over the years but also i'm i'm, I'm inviting the community so anybody who's reading this book now has this has access to all of these pages and they can add their own resources, videos, articles, exercises, retrospective tools, um, books, anything that they think, you know, this, this could be helpful if a team wanted to achieve this milestone. Um, and I'm going to, because I think I'm out of time, just a quick check, I've got 30 seconds left. So I kind of touched about all of these things here. So I will, I will call it time there. And rather than throw more information at you, I'll invite Steena to open up the Q and A. Is that all right? Yeah, just a second. I'll find it here. So I will stop the share, and you can gather what you what you would like. How was that for you, Yuri? I was a bit stressed. You were a bit stressed. Yeah, I will. I will not. Uh, I will. I will not. You know, play it uh, um, with uh, the deception. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's tough, but uh, it looks great. Yeah, thank you so much. It's the but, second page because you have the other one as well. Yeah, I I filled uh, two pages, and um, but it's also very rewarding. And when you do this, you really are following the speaker. Because um, I, 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 I really lost um, the sense of time and I, I, I was never threatened by phasing out or just getting rambling into my own mind. I really followed the talk, so it really helped me to stay focused and really follow deeply your narrative. So mm. yeah, the, there is a price to pay, but the reward is so much greater. So I feel good. It looks like our first question is for you on that, actually. How do you remember everything that's mentioned? Because I think I, I would be similar to, uh, to Lena here. I, while I'm sketching something, I'm, I, I'm worried that I might miss something that somebody's talking about. So how do you, how do, you do that? And, and yeah, I think I can refer to, to these situations. Uh, there were several times when I was still catching up with the previous part while you were on to the next one, but I cannot say that I wasn't listening. I think even though I was still fishing, uh, finishing off my uh, previous module, I, I was still following you. So that in a way helped me to, to, to stay concentrated as if I was holding a fiddle tool in my hand, right? So mm -hmm. I was drawing writing, even though it wasn't really directly pertaining. So I don't think it's a, it's a big uh, risk here because uh, you're still doing something with your hands, stimulating your brain activity. I wouldn't be... Um, worried about that too much so you're kind of putting down the the main points and exactly i think a lot of the uh, you, there's an element for me maybe of trusting my my subconscious that 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 the other stuff is that i'm saying while you're doing that is going in somewhere and you can you can bring it back from the hooks that you've got on the paper is that right yes absolutely and also i don't want to i don't i don't want to chase something uh, like ideal um, there is a part of me trying to get there leaving me stressed but I want to work with myself constantly reminding myself that it's not the intention to have the illustration the intention is to have a good experience 
right. uh, to engage with what you're talking about and being able to concentrate on what is essential. And then this lack of time actually helps me because it forces me to to choose the, the, the juiciest parts of what you're talking about and finding a good repre a visual representation for those. That's a really interesting way of putting it, actually. For me, I, I think if you hadn't said that, I would have probably been thinking, yeah, I want to capture the talk on the paper but actually what you're saying is it's to it's it's the experience and it make it helps you remember stuff by doing the the, the visualization yes and and right now if uh, if you for example try to refer to a part of your narrative for example to to reiterate or or maybe put more details i would even have um, a visual memory of where we need to navigate back to uh, that i think talks about uh, the efficacy of the method when it comes to memorizing material and organizing that for yourself mm. cool super cool yeah then the next question from lena as well where would you put the user manuals for a team is it something that should be visual for everyone or just for the team? Uh, I, I wouldn't put them on the wall visible for everyone um, necessarily, but because I think one of the, one of the biggest things in getting value from them is, is a sense of safety. So what I have seen teams do is, and I haven't really seen, I've seen different variations and they call it different things. So there's like the, trying to think of what they were called now one of them was definitely called a journal like a team journal or a team archive so it was like a big um big book type thing really and they would they would keep them in there and every year they or every project or every release they, they do sort of summarization so it was somewhere they could go quite often they'd be in a password protected part of the a team wiki or something like that um but i think i'm going to tie that into into yuri's point here if you like and say well actually it's the it's the it's the it's the sharing of it rather than the artifact itself that's more important um so i'm, I'm pretty sure you'll remember a couple of things um about that user manual even if you can't remember all of them and to be honest if we were if we were in the same team and you just remembered one or two things and i've known that you've remembered those one or two things I'm immediately thinking more favorably of you. We've immediately got a stronger bond. We've immediately improved something. Even if I don't expect you to be the perfect teammate and I don't expect you to expect me to be the perfect teammate, but if we're trying to help each other, then I think that's, that's the good thing. And you'll, you'll pick a few things up. I have known a few teams who have felt safe making them public. And I would suggest that the more visual they are, the better because the icons mean something more once you've had the discussion about them. So Yuri's icons mean more to him than they do to other people because he, he's made that association with that icon and what, what that icon represents. If I hadn't explained those icons to you and just shown you that user manual, you might have interpreted some of them the same, but you might have misinterpreted some of them. But I feel safer because all you're doing is making your own suppositions, which you will do just by observing my behavior anyway, if that makes sense. I should open chat really and see if Lena's saying, yeah, that's answered my question. Yeah, let's hope that answered the question. Okay. Next one, how often do you experience that team members, oh, sorry, I need to move this, can actually select if they want to be in a team or not? I think it's a very rare case. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It is rare. Um, but again, just having the having the conversation and the explicit conversation of you can opt out. All right. Uh, I think just having that conversation of am I am I okay with this? Um, is better than just saying we are part of this team, we've got to make it work. So I have seen people select out of a team a lot more than I have people see people say, yeah, okay, let's, let's, let me join this team, let me join that team. And by, by not opting out, you are effectively opting in. Um, and I think that that choice element is important, but it doesn't have to be that everyone is, is in charge of which team they're on. Again, that, that might sound like I'm contradicting myself, but there is a subtle difference there. And so 
just by having the conversation about what what would I need to be and I'll, I'll tell you what actually what I see more of is once we're having the conversation about am I okay being part of this team we also need to have a conversation about well what does being part of this team mean so what what are my teammates expectations of me what are my expectations of you uh, as a team member and am I prepared am I okay with meeting those or do we need to have a bit of a negotiation and if we can't have a successful negotiation then we're not going to be a successful team. So we either accept that we're going to be together, stuck together, but we can't really be a team, or we work out a way of, if we can't negotiate a successful resolution, then we work out a way of changing the composition. Yes, let's move on to the next one. Can you touch upon the leader manager aspect? I have personally seen managers destroy teams so they can be in a leadership position. I have too. Um, however, I don't see it very often now, uh, or I certainly see it less often now, because, because because I think the expectation of leaders has changed within organisations. So, for a leader to be seen as successful in a, in an organisation that's operating in, say, a complex domain or where you would be using agile teams, it's pretty well known now that it, it, enabling as a leadership trait is much more stronger than directing much more valuable than directing. And the expertise is less likely to be found in one person. So when you're operating in a relatively simple environment or, or at least a complicated repeatable environment, then leadership is, has historically been put into the hands of someone who's known the most or been there the longest and has the most expertise and experience. But problems are so complex now uh, that you can't rely on one person to have the most expertise. We need we need a team, and as an organ, if I'm running an organisation, or if I'm if I'm representing the shareholders of an organisation, and there's someone in there who is just looking for power, looking for control, and looking for uh, to to run other people, I know that's going to be a less effective way of working. That's going to cost us money. It's going to cost us people. It's going to cost us talent, and so leaders higher up don't stand for that. I see that a lot more often now than I see egos destroying teams. It does still happen. And you, I see people leave the organization and go somewhere else. Um, but that sense of um, waste and loss is so keenly felt within organizations these days, it's less of a risk in my experience. Okay, I think it's time to move on to the final part. Thanks for answering the questions. If you have a few additional smaller questions, you can post them in the, in the chat. I will stop sharing here. And then Yuri, we are you're next on the agenda for guiding us through some of the templates. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I'm really blown away with this idea of uh, operating model. Is that the correct term I'm using? Uh, user manual is the one that they, uh, that they use. User manual. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, but that's, that's the thing I, I was referring to at least. I used the, their own name. Um, but user manual, I really like the idea. So, so I'm just thinking maybe we could uh, use this time now, we, we, how much time we have, but then 15 minutes stops. Uh, maybe we could just play together by creating a user manual for each individually and uh, learn this by doing. And if you like the tool, maybe we could bring that technique back to our teams and maybe use that uh, as our next uh, retrospective exercise or maybe team building exercise and maybe incorporate that practice back in our working environment. And, and, by doing that, we will also learn a few more tricks about sketch noting, like icons and use of a white space and all of that stuff. So what do you say? Sounds good, Yuri, let's try it. Okay, so for that, you will need an A4 if you are um, a physical drawing person, or you could do that on your drawing device uh, like an ipad or uh, a windows device it doesn't matter and uh, there create a new document 
to do electronically, or as I said, just to pick a piece of paper. A4 is a, the, the most uh, fitting for the purpose because it holds enough space. And if we have people using a different, uh, different format for paper, it, it has the analog called a letter size. So letter size or an A4 size. Uh, put a title somewhere in, in the top, a user menu, and uh, put your name below. So user manual for Yuri Maloshenko, because I'm going to create uh, one for myself, and you will be creating one for yourself. So first thing first, we can decorate it really quickly, and uh, we will also learn a technique for drawing nice looking faces without uh, putting too much effort into it. It's really simple. So um, draw an oval, and then when you're done, find uh, the middle part, put a couple of dashes for the eyes. After that, put a kind of a nose here, and just an arch for a smile, a couple of brows, upward looking so it's a positive expression on the face then find again that line that divided the face in two halves and put ears and the most uh, the most difficult part is the hairstyle but don't overdo that just just put a few lines uh, to resemble your uh, hair basically and if it if it doesn't look super nice it, it it's okay it just has to be close enough to what your hairstyle looks like now and don't just spend too much time on it. So I, I, I will do something like that. Something like that. Just keep it simple and, and quick. Uh, we don't want to spend too much time. A couple lines for the neck, just a, just a slight line for the shoulders and that is your portrait out there. If you wear glasses, put the glasses, uh, but again, keep it simple and just 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 like that and now you have your face there so if you do the exercise with your entire team of course the faces will be different but that even being far away from how you look in reality i promise you that will be uh, identified almost immediately we've done a similar exercise uh, with uh, teams before not in the context of user manual that's totally new for me but uh, some people would even use those as their avatars in the systems later on it doesn't matter that it's not super nice if people like it because they've done that themselves so um i might need your help jeff here because I might uh, uh, not remember all of the parts, but as I remember, we had skills, uh, warning, and defects here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for that matter, just let's uh, just let's uh, use this part here, and like roughly divide that in in three equal parts. And it's okay. It's okay to mess up. It doesn't have to be super ideal. So write uh, skills here skills uh, here we will uh, write down the warnings and the defects here now we could leave it like that and it's totally fine because it's already a, an, a nice um, a nice um, what you can say a nice template without uh, further beautification but we could also just uh, top it up a, a notch by, for example, using a range icon for skills and just start with the equal sign on this, uh, like at, at an angle, then uh, the houses here, like, like the houses roofs, and then end it with uh, a move like that. So that will be our uh, icon for skills. For warnings, we could use, for example, a, a simple icon as an exclamation mark inside of a circle. And for defects, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe a broken glass, uh, like a martini glass uh, with a crack in it. I don't know if it's a good icon or not. I'm, I'm totally winging it now. But you can choose whatever uh, you feel works better for you. So, and then we will leave uh, these parts uh, empty for now, uh, because then uh, we also want to, um, 
create uh, the placeholders for four more sections. Uh, the operating instructions. And somewhere here, the, the, the troubleshooting. Okay, so operating instructions. I would just go ahead and, and, and draw a clipboard. You start with a, with a rectangle here, leaving an open space in here, and then the clip goes here. And then a couple of uh, two or three boxes uh, with uh, the lines, a kind of a checklist. So that's the uh, that's a possible uh, icon for the uh, operating instructions. Uh, the troubleshooting. Well, I need your help. What could be an icon for troubleshooting? Anyone? A gun. A gun. It's a, it's a very aggressive troubleshooting, <laughs> but that's fine. Uh, we can draw a gun. Um, a, a, a syringe with a vaccine. Okay. So it will be a gun crossed with a syringe. Or, or, or Okay, I, it's too late for me to turn that into syringe. So I'll just have a gun. Okay, but if you haven't uh, <laughs> drawn the gun yet, yeah, draw whatever works for you. And then uh, superpowers. So here we can write down superpowers. And re respectively here, the kryptonite section. And, and, and for superpowers, maybe as simple as letter S inside of uh, that diamond shape and the kryptonite maybe something like um, those crystals and usually uh, crystals are drawing something like looking like uh, directional signs with uh, uh, with the facets and something like that so that gives you a nice uh, playing field and um, it already is enough uh, to host um, the collection of the interesting facts that you would like to share with your team and um, you could do it two, two ways. You could just continue writing uh, things down and even use some combination of icons and words if you want to, but just bulleted text will do the trick as well. And uh, sometimes if you use uh, sticky notes of this size, you could do that on the sticky notes uh, so that, for example, you could change your mind later on. If you think, okay, I should probably put it differently. So you could populate your template with sticky notes if you like, or you just, you just draw it directly on paper, whatever you prefer. And um, how much can we set aside for uh, filling the template out? Uh, Sina, how much time do you think we could give uh, for, for, for finishing off uh, the template? Um, <laughs> not much, <laughs> a couple of minutes. <laughs> okay, so wh but, uh, what if we do this? What if we do this? We don't do it now, but that's a homework to fill it out at your uh, preferred pace. And if you feel like you just shared that through uh, the preferred channel, um, what, what, what's the, uh, the regular way for sharing stuff uh, within the group? And uh, yeah, and, and that could become like an offline dialogue around that. Um, because I, I think two minutes is not enough to fill it uh, out. Probably not, but it is a super cool uh, template we just made. And I think it would be super useful with, with our team, something we can take back as, as you mentioned and work with. Okay, cool. So um, yeah. Guess, Was it uh, just a few questions to what uh, markers uh, you use for, for the highlights? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, that's a very popular question. Um, I use uh, Neuland markers uh, today. And um, basically, I'm an ambassador of this trademark in Denmark. And if you're interested uh, to purchase some of their products, I can grant you an ambassador's discount as well. I can share that uh, through Stina with uh, with uh, the people on the group. And the ones that I used for this session in particular 
is uh, the technical pen for lines and drawings and texts and uh, brush pens of different colors called the uh, fine ones. Uh, my preferred colors are a light gray for the nuanced shadows and a couple of um, neutral colors like light blue and uh, yellow that do not um, convey uh, a particular meaning. They just highlight just to make it uh, stand out, uh, uh, make it easier to navigate uh, meanings. So that's, that's what I've been using. And if you're interested, um, I can share some nice discounts with you if you want to purchase that from them directly. Sounds good, Yuri. Maybe you can just share your uh, sketch noting from uh, Jeff's talk so we can Absolutely, see it. absolutely. I will uh, photograph uh, these uh, notes and uh, share that with uh, everyone who participated. And also, if uh, there are others that would like to, to share what you have uh, done today, maybe you can uh, either you want to show it here now just a few or then you can also upload photos on the meetup groups and uh, on instagram you yes can use uh, these uh, hashtags ab absolutely i can do that there will be a link for we will out for feedback and uh, i hope you all enjoyed this uh, this uh, really cool event where we combine two uh, really cool topics i think um we apologize for the confusion in the beginning with the password. Uh, we were trying to avoid the uh, cases of Zoom bombing, uh, but hopefully we managed to let people in who were interested in joining. Did anyone show anything? You can go to gallery view, then you can uh, see people. Yeah, maybe you, you can stop sharing. So we'll exactly you can see it then in the gallery view. Oh. Super cool. See here from Julia. Ah, there are some really nice ones already. That's really nice to see. Very cool. We will share the link to the recording as well. Are you sharing the link to uh, the feedback as well, Pavel? It's in already the chat in the chat. It's, it's already in chat. Cool. Otherwise, uh, from here, I'll just say thanks for, for joining and hope you had fun.